there are three main points to remember about using this modeler, and they are shown here. Now, firstly, that the modeler does not represent any actual river stock, but is a hypothetical one. Secondly, it is assumed that this hypothetical stock is living under pristine, unimpacted conditions. And thirdly, the impacts shown are not immediate results, but what will happen in a few generations when the changes made have settled down into a new equilibrium. More information on how the modeler works and the assumptions it's based on can be found by clicking on these information boxes. Note also that there are options for the type of stock to be looked at. You can look at either a mixed grills and salmon stock or a grills only one. Uh, the assumption for the mixed grills and salmon stock is that 50% of the fish will mature at the end of the first year at sea and return as grills, while the remainder will stay at sea for another year and return as salmon. In this video we're going to look at the mixed grills and salmon stock. And we'll start with the egg stage, which can be found here at the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. And look at what happens if egg-to-par survival deteriorates, which we can do by clicking on the minus button here. We can see the effect on smolts up here and on the par-to-smolt survival rate here. If we steadily deteriorate egg-to-par survival by clicking on the negative side of the button, you will see that smoke numbers actually change very little, even with an impact of minus 20%. This is because in a pristine state, populations are rather overloaded with eggs, so competition for territories between newly hatched fry is severe, resulting in great losses. This is what is called density-dependent mortality. In other words, the denser the fish are packed, the higher their mortality. A slackening in this competition from fewer eggs can result in more fry surviving. This is one of the great survival mechanisms of the salmon as it compensates for reductions in numbers of eggs. You will see that the power to smoke survival rate has now increased slightly by 0.2%. This is a result of less competition between fewer par. You may have noticed too that smoke numbers increased very slightly to begin with as egg to par survival deteriorated. This was due to decreased competition resulting in less than one extra fish spawning which doesn't actually show up on the model. It should be noted too that the number shown in the boxes for the juvenile stages were the start of each stage so changes to impacts of carrying capacity in the box will not have a direct effect on the number in that box. The effect will come from a change in the number of spawners and the impact this will have on subsequent generations. Remember too that the change figures show average numbers when the population has reached a new equilibrium, not changes the following year. At an impact of minus 50% or 50% below pristine conditions, you can see that the number of smokes has still not changed greatly. It's down by about 1,600, which is just 12.5% reduction in smokes for a 50% reduction in egg to par survival. This is another sign of the lack of any very direct link between numbers of eggs and numbers of smokes due to density-dependent mortality. When deterioration reaches 73% below pristine conditions, the population then drops into unsustainability. This is the sort of catastrophic situation created by acidification or sedimentation when eggs are unable to hatch properly. Note that unsustainability does not drive the population directly to extinction, but reduces it to a very low level where it will be very vulnerable to other factors. You can think of increased predation on such a weakened and vulnerable population. That completes a quick survey of what happens to salmon populations when their egg to power survival deteriorates from pristine.
but can a population that is doing well under pristine conditions do even better? Salmon fry in power territorial and fight each other to gain and keep the space they need for food and shelter. If they fail to find or keep a territory, then they must live on the margins and are likely to starve or be eaten by predators. The number of territories any area of steam can support depends on its physical structure and the amount of food that it produces, and this is called its carrying capacity. Fry and par can get the food they need from smaller territories and richer streams, so carrying capacity can vary greatly from one stream to another, and we can investigate the effects of carrying capacity by using these buttons here for egg to par and here from par to smoke. The easiest and most direct way of increasing carrying capacity is to remove barriers so that the quantity of spawning area increases. Habitat quality can also be improved, but this is a less direct and more difficult approach. So, starting back with a model showing the situation for a salmon population under pristine conditions, we can see what happens if carrying capacity is increased for the egg to par stage. So if we put that up by 20%, you can see that it has quite a notable effect on small numbers. They increase to just over 14,000 compared to just under 13,000 for pristine conditions. But note that survival rate from par to smoke actually drops from the pristine rate of 26%. This is because the carrying capacity for par has not increased while that for the egg to par the fry stage has. There are more par certainly, but they are being squeezed into the same amount of par habitat that there was before, so their rate of survival to the smoke stage decreases despite the overall increases in numbers. But if we also increase the par to smoke carrying capacity by 10% or so, you can see that the effect on smoke numbers is even greater, increasing it to almost 15,000. What this is showing is that the effect of increasing the carrying capacity at just one stage of the life cycle is restricted by bottlenecks further along the system which have not had their capacity proportionately increased. If managers therefore want to get the full benefit of increasing carrying capacity at one stage of the life cycle, they have to ensure there is sufficient space at all other stages for the increased numbers. The model allows the effect of various combinations of increasing carrying capacity at the egg to par and par to smoke stage to be looked at. Other interesting questions can also be examined. For example, what effect does increased carrying capacity at these stages have if the conditions are less than pristine? Moving on to the smolt stage, the number shown in the smolt box of the model is the number that start their migration downstream in the spring. Only 26% of the power reached this stage, which is less than 1% of the number of eggs laid. A major change occurs with smolts. Lower numbers cannot be compensated for by better survival of the remainder. Smolts are the sum total of the freshwater stage of the life cycle and every one lost has a direct effect on the number of fish that come back from the split sea. Smolt survival is therefore a key issue in salmon management and the effect of reductions in smolt migration can be tested using the model. Note that since the number shown in the box is the number of smolts that start their migration, increasing the impacts in emigrating smolts will not directly affect this number. The impact reduces the number of smolts getting to the sea and therefore the number returning as adults, which then reduces the number of eggs. But this reduction in eggs is firstly partly compensated for by increased survival on the egg to par stage, although par numbers are still reduced a bit, and secondly the reduction in par results in some further compensation in the par to smolt stage. So smolt numbers are reduced by less than the impact on them might suggest. So if we deteriorate the smolt migration to 10% less than pristine, 
it can be seen that this 10% or so reduction in deterioration in smoke migration directly drops the numbers of returning adults, returning growths and returning salmon by about 10%. And if the smoke migration deteriorates by about 20%, you get about a 20% reduction in returning growths and salmon. In fact, the model shows that for every 10% worsening in smoke migration, approximately 10% fewer adults return. There is now a considerable amount of evidence that losses of smokes downriver can be very considerable, even to more than half. The main causes of this are predation and barriers, and the combination of these. In fact, losses at these sorts of levels can drive a population into unsustainability. So if the smoke migration worsens to 48% below pristine, you can see that that drops it into an unsustainable situation. So anything that makes their downstream migration more difficult will reduce the numbers of returning adults. However, the opposite is also true. Anything that improves smoke migration, anything that reduces the effect of predation or the effect of barriers on them, directly increases the numbers of returning adults, as can be seen in the returning growth and returning salmon boxes. Once the smokes get to the sea, they face hazards there from predators and food scarcities and changes in sea temperatures and ocean current patterns. Marine survival greatly affects the numbers of returning adults, as can be seen from the modeler. So, if marine survival deteriorates by 10%, it drops the numbers of returning growth and returning adults by 156, uh, which is obviously not good for fisheries. Marine survival is such an important factor that improvement in it can mitigate adverse impacts elsewhere in the system. So if things get worse for smoke migration by 20%, this drops the number of returning growths and adults by 165% below what would be got from pristine conditions. However, if marine survival at the same time improves by 20%, you can see that you get 114 more returning fish than from the pristine situation. In other words, with better marine survival, you can get more adults from fewer smokes. This shows that if marine conditions were better, many less than pristine populations could do well. However, over the past 30 years or so, marine survival has fallen dramatically. Even if everything is pristine in fresh water, poorer marine conditions will still reduce a population. So if marine survival drops by 10%, the number of returning adults drops by about 20%. And in fact, even with everything pristine in fresh water, if marine survival continues to drop and gets to 28%, below pristine conditions, the population will drop into unsustainability and so increase in chances for extinction even though the freshwater system is in pristine condition. It's also of interest to see what happens to the model if marine survival rates are improved, which can be done by using the plus button. Note the effects on power and smoke numbers from the increased competition if you try this. The next two boxes show the effects of exploitation and other human impacts on the number of returning adults that survive to spawn. The buttons can be used to increase the numbers killed by rods and nets, whether they're salmon or grills. The effect of increasing the difficulties in upstream migration by, for instance, barriers can also be looked at. And it's interesting to see just how heavy the exploitation is that the pristine stock can take. So if the nets take 30% of the growth, 
and 30% of the salmon. You can see that this is not having very much effect on small numbers or on, for that matter, numbers of returning grills or returning salmon. And if we add on rod exploitation, 25% of the grills, and you can see that heavy exploitation can also be made of the salmon. And it's not till we get to that sort of level of exploitation that the population drops into unsustainability. But notice how comparatively little the effects have been on smolts and power numbers. This again is because in a pristine situation the system is rather overloaded with eggs and fry and competition between juveniles is a major source of losses. Reducing the number of eggs therefore has little effect on numbers in the later stages of the life cycle. This shows that in good or pristine situations there is a large harvestable crop that can be taken from salmon populations by netting and angling without doing them any harm. This shows why good salmon populations are so valuable they can be heavily exploited without damaging them. However, if the system is not pristine, things are different. If you set the model so all impacts on marine survival are down by 10%, carrying capacity is down by the same, so not pristine, but not by any means a bad situation, you can find out what sort of exploitation by nets and rods can be sustained and you'll find that it's a lot less than for the pristine situation. The importance of marine survival is shown again by the fact that all the factors in the rise of the life cycle are set to pristine, but marine survival alone is down by 25%. You can see that the harvestable crop becomes much less. So the nets take 7% of the gills and 6% of the salmon. That drops the population in sustainability. In fact, even if you have no nets taking salmon or gills, rod exploitation alone can turn the population into unsustainability. The final box then shows the number of spawners. Even without human impacts, not all returning salmon and grills survive to spawn. The modeler assumes a loss rate of 5%. Those that do reach the spawning gravels then start the whole cycle all over again.